Right, that was a fabulous um, interview with uh, Bob, as usual. <laughs> I learned heaps, and uh, now we've got like a wonderful smorgasbord of different uh, investors this morning, and uh, they're going to uh, be moderated by Andrew. Andrew's going to introduce everyone, do a self-introduction, have a big conversation, and then I'll be open to the floor again for everyone to ask questions. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, great. Um, before, before I introduce myself or have uh, the panel introduce themselves, just to understand where to focus our discussion um, to who's here, raise your hand if you are um, a venture capitalist. <laughs> okay. It's mainly found. This email is going to crash. Okay. And raise, your, raise your hand if you're an active angel investor. <laughs> okay. If, and uh, what if, if you're an entrepreneur who's already raised venture capital funding? If you're an entrepreneur that's already raised angel funding? Okay, fantastic. Okay, great. So my name is Andrew Romans. I'm a co-founder of Georgetown Angels. We're a hybrid VC fund and angel group. So we've raised money from our angels and family offices and the fund invests. And if you've invested in the fund, you can co-invest in any deal you want on a deal by deal basis. So that's what we do. Um, why don't we start from the far end and each person introduce themselves and let's try to be you know, under one or two minutes so we have time Matthew. to. To talk. Me this and maybe, maybe if you can um, disclose, if nothing else, uh, what you know, the main sectors you invest in, the geography where you invest, and maybe the stage that you invest, so people can walk away knowing when to target you with their opportunity. Of course, uh, Edith Young and we're Right Ventures. Uh, we do like early stage seed investment, focus on a lot of cloud infrastructure, platform as service, um, and mobile. Great. My name is Agosa. I am GP at Echo VC. We do two types of, uh, of uh, investments based on geography. In the U.S., we're doing micro seed investments in um, a variety of sectors: mobile, uh, cloud, um, uh, SaaS, and uh, graph-related um, interests. And then in Africa, we're doing seed and early stage uh, across pretty much anything that's technology-related. What's micro seed? That's at the way under 100 grand. Oh, under 100 grand. Under 100 grand? Yeah. I wanted to ask too. In starting how low? As low as 20, 25. Huh. Yeah. 25. 5 to 1,000. 25, 25,000. Yes. <laughs> 25, 25 bucks. 25 cents. <laughs> 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 Maybe next week. Okay. Uh, William Quigley with uh, Clearstone. We uh, incubate. We invest all over the world. Uh, China and India as well as uh, parts of Europe. A lot in Southern California, where I where I am based, and I guess a lot up here too. Uh, probably about half our portfolio is in Southern is in Northern California. Uh, the areas that I particularly focus on are online gaming, online gambling, financial services, and Bitcoin, and uh, most things mobile. A lot of mobile and wireless. Uh, Kevin Swan, I'm a partner with Inovia Capital. We're a, a seed and early stage fund, uh, initially based out of Canada, but we have a, a North American focus, so we're about, probably have half our companies on each side of the border. Um, we have a portfolio of almost 50, so we're very active, um, mainly across uh, e-commerce, cloud, SaaS, um, mobile, mobile devices, and we actually, uh, for Bob, we even have a few semi-companies as one of my partners, very well versed in that space. Um, this been background in our firm. There's five partners, and we all uh, we all have operational entrepreneurial backgrounds. Three of the five of us are engineers. Just kind of give you a little bit of an idea of kind of the the, the character and makeup of our, our firm. Hi, Patrick Sidisi. I'm with DBL Investors in San Francisco. We are a early and mid with some allocation for seed stage venture fund that's also focused on impact investing as well. Um, we're a generalist fund, but our Historical and current investments are pretty much in the areas of clean tech, IT, and sustainability-oriented products and services for the consumer, uh, and a little bit of healthcare. And we focus mainly on the Western U.S., but it's, we have a national footprint uh, for our investment as well. I'm Matt Goldstein. Uh, I'm a <clears throat> relatively new associate at Trinity Ventures, uh, which is a uh, large early stage venture fund. Uh, we have eight general partners and two associates uh, split into an enterprise and a consumer team. Uh, we make about a dozen invest investments a year, primarily at the Series A stage with a little bit of B. Um, we've been around for 27 years, so we're the oldest guys, one of the oldest guys on Sand Hill, uh, investing broadly across uh, e-commerce, um, 
uh, mobile gaming on the enterprise on the consumer side and on the enterprise uh, cloud infrastructure, uh, security, mobile enterprise, and application SaaS. So Matthew, let me start with you. When um, do, are you, do you know when the Trinity closed its last fund? November twenty twelve. November twenty twelve. Yep. What is your sense of the um, balance of? Bob brought this up in his in his talk. Uh, what's the balance right now of money and investment opportunities? Is there too much money chasing too few management teams, or are accelerators pumping them out like Big Macs, and there's not enough money to feed the demand for um, you know, good startups that require funding that should make money? Sure, um, it's definitely possible that there's there's too much money chasing the same sort of entrepreneurial ecosystem that existed in the past. Uh, I haven't been in the industry long enough to, to have a historical perspective, but I hear my partners talk about the, uh, the frenzy. Um, I can definitely say that we, we see uh, valuations going up. We see companies that are raising three or four what, times what we think they should be raising based on their progress. The amount that, of money? The, the, amount the, of money? The, the amount of money, which, which doesn't necessarily speak to them being uh, a good or a bad team that should or shouldn't raise, but they're raising three times more than they, in our, in, in our view, need to. Uh, which is good for them because you know that gives them time to pivot, but it can also be bad for them if they uh, sort of mess around for too long. Okay, and I, I want to hear other perspective on this, but but with Trinity and its 20 years of of wiseness, um, what do you think is an appropriate runway that a company should be raising for? Meaning, um, yeah. you know, it's uncertain where the revenue is coming in, but let's just assume it's going to be a little stormy. Um, is it? You wouldn't want to fund them for three months and be right back you know, with knee pads on. What's your perspective? I, I mean, the, the answer varies hugely depending on what they're working on and what stage they are when they're coming in. Uh, one example is a company uh, that we backed at the seed stage when they came out of YC, which was called Dot Cloud at the time. Uh, we encouraged them to raise a very large round that ended up being a $9 million Series A uh, split between us and Benchmark, which gave them almost two years. And today, Dot Cloud is Docker, which is a, a tremendous containerization technology. They spent basically two years uh, essentially failing to, to deliver a successful PaaS business. Uh, launched, launched Docker as an open source containerization technology. Uh, they just closed a spectacular Series B from Greylock, and um, you know they're one of the crown jewels of our portfolio. So we couldn't be happier that we gave them enough time to, to figure this out, because this is not at all what they came in with. OK. OK, and, and particularly in Africa, you, you know, I would imagine that there's not a ton of competition compared to say like the New York environment, where there's probably a lot of money and not as many teams. Right. What's your perspective on um, the balance of money to investment opportunities? Well, in Africa, it's actually interesting. Um, there is, technology is still uh, uh, somewhat, you know, lower case opportunity for a lot of people. Um, you know, the giant opportunities there tend to be very infrastructure driven. Uh, a friend of mine who's doing a private equity deal in power was like, and I quote, he goes, I sensitized the shit out of this thing and it's still 16x over five years. <laughs> and uh, so when you now want to go and do a venture and you're telling someone it's 3x in 10, it looks a little like you've lost your mind. Um, but still, you know, we're big believers that technology will change a lot of that and we're seeing it even in Africa from, from financial services, for instance. You don't have a lot of legacy, so they're skipping a lot of the segments that we sort of here went through and uh, you know you, you know you're seeing interesting things around mobile payments I go to Kenya you know I, I come here and I struggle to try to pay I'm trying to bring out a, a card with a swipe and you know I can go in there and I just text the number behind the you know behind the the, 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 uh, the counter and I'm paid you know things like that are so simple work there you know the legacy businesses here are not uh, but some fundamental things are not there, and we, we like them. Logistics, a big deal. E-commerce, a big deal. Um, content and, and, and media. In Nigeria, for instance, there's 170 million people, and I believe the 15th movie theater just went on stream in December. Mm -hmm. That is the 15th. 15th. Not 15 <laughs> multiplexes, the 15th movie theater, right? And so, you know, you're looking at some of these things and going, this is incredible. You know, and of course, those are, I think that's where the, a lot of the, the upside is. So we're very excited about that. You know, mobile content is a big one. Uh, Nigeria's uh, content industry, Nollywood, is the third largest in the world after Hollywood and Bollywood. Um, what do you call that? Nollywood. Nollywood. <laughs> Nollywood. <laughs> right. Okay. And, and, uh, the, the, so, so a lot of these things, you know, are below the radar for a lot of the investors here. 
Uh, but we think that you know that will change. We're beginning to see folks coming there. Tiger is is very aggressive in Africa. Uh, very simple models. They're like if it worked in India, it will work. It will work in Africa, and they write very large checks. Well, let me just jump in. Yeah. Um, to, just to pass in this thread. So what about what about Canada? And then I'd like to hear a perspective on um, what what the actual sense is on early stage financings, and maybe even give some perspective of, you know, Bob talked about Apple opportunity being made available to them on a Friday, and they did what they what they probably should have done, which is they <coughs> delivered by Monday, right? Um, they were following Venrock, I think was the case, right? So, so, so Rockefellers were in there. So but I want to point out one thing which is interesting because we just now we learn a lot about Nigeria and Africa. Um, we you know got involved with uh, Dolphin, which just hit a hundred million install, which is originally from from China. China right. uh, I'm looking at actually through the Pitney program. I'm talking to Wally, which is a half a million. Uh, from Dubai, but the target market is all U.S. What, what we have found is that we found a lot of international, basically from all over the world, even though they're physically located somewhere else, but they're going after the U.S. market. Versus that, you know, we're also talking to some Chinese entrepreneur going after the Chinese market, which I'm Chinese, but doesn't make me an expert, right? So, so there's a lot of sort of learning back and forth, but I think there's sort of two, in, in terms of international, there's a lot of them coming in. But there's a lot of them also want us to get involved with, like, and you know, frankly, I'm also learning you know, the ch Chinese and Asian market mm -hmm. myself as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll quickly comment on, on Canada. I'm. Um, I, I originally got exposed to this whole industry down here, and then I okay. went back home. Uh, my my wife took the kids back and said I can join her if I like, and so I decided <laughs> to. And um, we're very fortunate to, to to build a career in startups. <coughs> I, I kind of have an unpopular view up there in that I really just view Canada as the 51st state, um, which uh, I know that's how most Americans do anyway. You're right, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I know, it's, it's, it's true. So, um, but, but really, there, there was some, some legislation issues around, uh, uh, I think called Section 116 that kind of kept American VCs out of Canada for a long time. And that was lifted about five, six years ago. And now money is just flowing across the border. Like I say, we invest on money. both sides. There's a fair amount of soft money in Canada as well, isn't there? I wouldn't say that. It, it does not have like a developed angel ecosystem like we have here. It's starting to, you know, burst. Soft government money. Government right? the guy oh, the sorry. I just got someone to tell me about his, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there is. And it's, it's non-dilutive grants, yeah. government. And, and that can be bad because what we get is a lot of zombie startups mm -hmm. that can live for years off of that. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, uh, that's not a good thing in our mind, um, for sure. But. You know, American VCs are very active up there now. Um, we syndicate most of our deals with U.S. funds. 40% um, of the VC money that went into Canada last year was from U.S. funds. Um, and I, I kind of find there's two sets of entrepreneurs um, in Canada. Maybe I'll say three if we, the ones going after all the grant money. Um, but the, the, the ones that realize that they're in a much bigger market than, than Canada and are immediately down fundraising with the North American kind of pursuit. You know, on the West Coast, they should be down here. On the East Coast, they should be in New York. Um, and then there's the other ones that just kind of, you know, look around Canada where there's only really five or six um, uh, you know, legit VC funds, and anyone here who's tried to raise money know you got to have a lot bigger target than five or six funds to talk to. But they kind of do the circuit in Canada and then say there's no money in Canada, whereas they should be down in the U.S. talking to dozens of funds. How many um, strong active firms are there in Canada? In your uh, uh, venture funds? Yeah. I'd say five or six, in all honesty. There's been a big... From, um, from east to west, that's the whole... Yep, yeah, that's about it. Uh, there, there was more, a lot of them died. Um, in fact, there's been a real kind of turnover in the last 10 years. Okay. Uh, so some new funds. There's been a few U.S. ones that have put, put offices up there as well. What really killed Canada was the corporate VC um, LP market mm -hmm. just completely disappeared after the dot-com boom. And you talk to guys, um, even in our fundraising efforts, we've been very fortunate of having uh, very supportive uh, LPs, but you talk to some of these past LPs who were, uh, you know, the corporate venture, and they still wear the scars of the dot-com bust and won't let it go. Okay. They're just That's like, never do it again. I'd like to get into some specifics on valuations for seed companies and, and how these are structured. Um, are these are you seeing price rounds? Are you seeing exclusively convertible notes? And what sort of pre-money valuations and or caps do you see on the notes for companies that are say pre-revenue but getting your interest? If if you do invest in companies at that stage. I'll, I'll throw it very quickly. So we're seeing um, timed, timed valuations. That happens a lot. So you come in early, and you get a certain you get a certain valuation, and if you come in later, you get a, a higher valuation. And so of course, the entrepreneurs are really trying to figure out who who's willing to step up, and write a check. 
and that person or that group will get rewarded with a lower valuation, uh, depending on if the entrepreneurs have a product uh, that already has some measurable data in terms of interacting with consumers or the, or the, or the, or the customer, um, you're getting valuations anywhere between the three and five range. Um, and then they also get up because of competition. Uh, but, you know, and in terms of structures, it's really all over the map. Everybody talks about, oh, convertible notes, convertible notes. Um, of course, everybody listens to Y Combinator, so you know, they have this new structure. Called, yeah, no cap. Good, right, good, good, safe, good, good, you know, good. and it's like, hey, you know, in other words, <laughs> you should feel grateful that you're in this deal, so don't even ask for, you know, a discount or whatever it is. Um, and then some people sort of do the traditional convertible notes, 20, 25% discount, four to five million dollar cap. Um, and then, of course, if the entrepreneur, uh, the founders have any um, prior experience, even if it didn't turn out to be a great one, uh, you know, we're seeing caps that are getting to that six to eight range. Yeah. So okay. generally, right, I mean, plain vanilla terms, you know, eight percent, six to eight percent coupon. The highest cap we've seen in a deal that we did was 10 million, but the founder had exited multiple successful multi hundred million dollar startups. So. And that was then that was a, a pre-revenue company. It was pre-revenue, pre-product company. Um, in the clean tech side, it's it's pretty much the same. It, it, we see people coming in for 500k to a million five of a note, sometimes two million. But we saw one today, uh, this past week, that wanted two and a half million in convertible notes at like a 20 percent discount. But they're a fast-growing um, transit service aggregator company, and so they've they've got some good traction. They have a good team. And at that stage, it's really about, do we think that the, is this a great team that can execute? Because we know they'll have to change course four or five, six times. Does their business model or their thesis about what they're going to do pass a test of reasonableness? And then beyond that, it's, they've got to get a product out in the market and see what happens. Okay. Although it takes longer and more money for clean tech versus an IT company. Okay. And then just maybe one answer on this from the panel. What's, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs in how to best approach um, your firm seeking funding. I, you know, I, I would just echo a lot of things Bob said. Honestly, um, I, I always go back to the dating analogy. Um, for us, we're we're very personally driven, um, in terms of relationship driven per, on a personal level. So uh, we want to know the entrepreneur. We see it as a marriage. We um, and I think part of it's us being all former operators and entrepreneurs. That we don't really approach it as much much as like a financier, but more as like a partnership to build a company. Um, one of the litmus tests I personally come to use is uh, I ask myself, would I join the company? You know, would I work for this founder? And if I would, if I'd be excited to join it, that's a great kind of litmus test of kind of my, uh, you know, my passion for what they're doing. Um, so this is high level, I guess. Yeah, and when you're making an early investment, I think it's useful for entrepreneurs to understand the, the investor's perspective. Um, Bob was talking about a five to 10x. If you're investing early stage, what kind of you know, multiple are you really, um, you know, fighting for, expecting, and, and if you're investing a bit later stage, does that change? Do you have like set multiples that you're looking to make on any single investment? I'll throw out an answer. Um, I, I, I spent uh, a summer with another fund called uh, Javelin up in the city. Uh, it's a $100 million fund. Trinity's current one is a $325 million fund. So we think less about the multiples and more about the whole move the needle question. Mm -hmm. Uh, which which influences a couple different things. It influences the size of the multiple we're looking for, the size of the check that we're willing to write. Um, generally speaking, we're, we're hoping that any given investment could return the fund. Um, at Trinity, that's hard, so sometimes we'll settle for something that, you know, in sort of a best case scenario we could imagine w would return 150 to 200 million, that would be great. Um, whereas at Javelin, they, they were happy to find an investment that uh, in, in a pretty reasonable upside scenario could return 50 to 70. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one thing to consider when you are talking to different funds is, is realize what size the fund is, uh, what kind of pop they're looking for, and therefore real, <laughs> that'll, that'll probably really tell you uh, what kind of valuation they're expecting and what kind of ownership they're expecting uh, based on the, call it five-year revenue projections that you guys are, are showing. And whether it's even a fit. I mean, our friends had worked at other funds and they basically said, if it doesn't return a third of the fund, I can't bring it to the investment committee. Exactly. So. Um, Keep that in mind as you're thinking about you know, how big does this and how fast does this business grow. So our, our economics, our, our LPs give us a bucket of money. We try to give them two or three times that back in seven to ten years, which means that we need to get those big pops in the three to five year time frame spread across a portfolio of you know, 20 companies, knowing that 
15 may not do it. And you may have one or two that did return the fund, and that's what you're looking for. Okay. Yeah, the other, the other point well, I'd I probably make yeah. about this is that uh, it is, in the, in the many years I've been in <coughs> Bob, uh, though I remember you, Bob, from uh, Coffin Fellows, uh, yeah. early in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, but what I would say is, as what I've noticed over a couple of decades is that uh, VCs, and I'm as guilty of it as anybody, but pretty much everybody has less and less and less attention. They also have a very high bar <laughs> to be willing to get educated about what you're doing. And so the, the degree of specialization that VCs have gone through, when I started most people were generalists with a few exceptions, biotech and semiconductors. You'd never talk to a semiconductor guy about an internet deal, just or vice versa. Uh, it is very important for anyone raising money, and, and as an early stage guy, and a guy who incubates lots of deals, I'm out there just like you raising money for my companies, and my partners are doing the same thing. Uh, I always try to figure out, of the pe I never think of the firm, I think of the partner in the firm. Who is that person, and do they understand the ecosystem? The it, it, it mobile, mobile advertising, that is a freaking high bar to really understand. There are literally hundreds of venture-backed companies in that space. If someone hasn't made an investment in that area and you go to them, it's hopeless. You know, I mean, just hopeless. It could take them nine months and they don't have the time. So pretty much everybody aggregates. I would say the same thing for financial technology. If, God forbid, you're, you're raising money for a Bitcoin deal, I love Bitcoin, but if they are not using Bitcoin, if they haven't really immersed themselves in it, it's just, it's just a waste of time. And it's very easy now. When I started in venture capital, you would look for brochures, because venture capitalists published brochures. They, there wasn't anything online to figure out who did what. Nowadays, you can go online, you can see how many articles they've written, what their blogs are, and you can, you can find that out. I think that's almost as important as anything else. How big your deal is, all that. Because at the end of the day, this is real guesswork. I typically tell my limited partners, even though they hate, and my, even my partners hate when I say it, I think it's very random whether or not your company succeeds or not. It's very random. And that randomness is, you know, it goes up as you, you are working at the edge of trends. And of course, being right there, where there's some popular phenomenon you've decided to get involved with, is where the greatest upside is, but it's also where the degree of certainty is just, it's, it's incalculable. Uh, you know, when I was at Disney, I was a CFO. Uh, I loved having numbers in front of me telling me what, you know, we wouldn't get into an, an area unless there was at least t 10 years of data. We're all in things now where there's no data. In fact, if there is a report, a research report about your industry, it's probably too late for you. Uh, so just keep those things in mind. Fo focus on people who really are appreciated about what you're doing. Excellent advice and yeah. caution you. You might even succeed at getting money from a VC who doesn't under understand your industry and then that could become toxic. Um, but with that, yeah. let's um, open it up to questions. And Pimo, tell me how we take remote questions. I'm um, not sure. Yeah, so if everyone wants to now ask uh, any of the VCs or all of them um, any questions that they've got, please go ahead. This is your time. I would ask a question. For when you're investing in the gaming space, are you betting on the gaming laws in the U.S. changing or staying? When you say gaming, you mean gambling or you mean gambling? Gambling. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's true. Most of our gambling deals are outside of the U.S., mm -hmm. but if it's a skill based game, tournament based game, some of you may be familiar with the concept of esports, a gigantic trend. Uh, you know, that is an area uh, that we are heavily invested in in the U.S. Uh, I would say this, though, that we've got a dedicated uh, video gaming fund. Uh, there's not a lot of VCs who invest in gaming, video gaming. There's probably four or five guys I, I, I go to. Uh, but there's plenty of money. You just, it's kind of like if anyone has ever done any business in the apparel industry. There's no VCs who invest in apparel, but there's plenty of money. You just have to know the people in the industry. That's what I, I love the video game business. I really love it. And when, you know, the, the constant thing you'll hear is, well, it's a hit-driven business. 
so is venture capital, right? So are all tech companies. Uh, and, and the ability to grow very fast, very quickly, I think is, it's hard to beat uh, uh, the video game business. I just just to add, I was very surprised to see that um, Grand Theft Auto Five ships 32 million units at an average of 50 to 70 dollars per unit. All right, so you're right. <laughs> if you nail it, it is such a gem. Of course, it costs 250 million dollars to produce, so it requires quite a bit of investment. In, in terms of consumer, I do a lot in consumer. My Idea Lab was an incubator. I started that. Uh, in terms of consumer goods, there is no consumer good that has a greater longevity than a game. An average phone lasts six, nine months, a game, ten years. I, I, uh, this is actually uh, aimed at you, uh, William, only because I, obviously I was at Idea Lab, that's why yeah. I get, got to oh. know you. But I remember early on when Clearstone came walking around with Peter Thiel talking about PayPal in the early days, and it was it's to me as a, a, a method in which you all were at a restaurant and hey, someone owes you money, you can just send them some money through PayPal. And I thought, I don't find that compelling. And somehow that evolved and became a, a great business. So I was kind of wondering just, you know, kind of what goes through, you know, not only what you originally pitched the company as and how many iterations and kind of how you, how generally the companies are refining their message till they find, you know, what really works. Well, I think any entrepreneur who wants to be motivated should look at the PayPal story because there were 50 payment <coughs> companies at the time pay we funded PayPal. Uh, I'd also say that, you're right, it was used to do, any of you old enough to remember um, the Palm Pilot? Palm Pilot. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to do, they didn't, hadn't thought of email yet, so they beamed currency back and forth with Palm Pilots. Terrible business, basically. <laughs> uh, but when the, when the bubble crashed, I'll just say this, we could not raise money for the company. Three weeks before it shut down, uh, we found an abandoned company that uh, Sequoia had funded called X.com. You might know a guy named Milan Musk. Milan said, hey, take the company. We fired all the employees. Get the cash. And that's what we did. Uh, you know, 30 VCs turned us down. And, and of course, I would say now PayPal's been a very successful company. It was a great concept. But that just goes to show, you know, the VCs, and I'm as guilty as anybody, missed it all the time. Uh, you know, what's the term uh, du jour now? Pivot? I'm a big believer in, uh, in pivoting, uh, provided you have money. I, I, think, I think Bob maybe nailed it when he said what, is, what he was looking for. He wasn't talking about, you know, you know, how great the technology was. He was talking about trust. And in a world of pivots, you've invested in management team. So if real estate is location, 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 yeah. angel and venture capital investing is management, 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 market. Go after a big market with the right kind of people. They've got runway to you know, measure and see how they're doing. Uh, you stick with that team and pivot, and God help you, you lose your money, and you're with that team on, your next, on their next deal because they, you, you were an honorable VC with them the first time. So I think it's about people when it comes to that. Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, you know, Bill Harris, these guys have all gone on to make other hit records, you know, after PayPal. Hence the PayPal. And then you got guys like Sequoia who say, we invest in markets, so we don't care about the CEO. If we don't like them, we'll get another one. So, <laughs> and they've done right. okay too. Right? That's well, so true. I put market at the end. <laughs> that is, yeah. By the way, one thing I will say about the, these rules every rule that I have thought was important including after two awful semiconductor deals. I would never, ever, ever do a semiconductor deal. I did recently two semiconductor deals. Uh, you know, but the difference was they told me they'd need $6 million and uh, it looked like they could do it in $6 million, which was, used to be 50. So there are no rules that are probably hard and set in this industry. Yeah. More questions? How do you see the future of venture capitalism? Because you're all working in different markets. So do you see more funds being created in third world countries or countries where VC firms are not currently active? Or do you see more concentration here in the US and in Silicon Valley in particular? I think it's going to be a panel later on uh, yeah, the venture. You know, it's interesting for me being here and then leaving it. Um, 
in not too far away, just a couple hour, you know, couple hour flight away. But it's to me, what I really noticed the Silicon Valley has and nowhere else has is just that culture, and it hasn't really been replicated elsewhere. And for me, it's not an economic issue or it's a culture issue. Um, uh, you know, not many places are built to take these kind of risks and to uh, you know back essentially back those who have failed before. The biggest shock I had when I went back back home in, in, in Canada is if you, if you failed as an entrepreneur, you were you were done. Pretty much right here. That's not a black. That could even be, be a, you know a check mark on your resume if it was done in the right way and you, you kept that trust throughout the process. Um, so so I, I don't know. I, I I don't have an answer for that. Just saying that it, I think it's more of a culture issue. I think if you look in like um, you know Ghost might be able to, to comment on Africa, but I would imagine there that they they kind of have more of that culture than than other places in the world. Um, it's, it's, a little, it's, a little, it's a little weird though because the entrepreneurs are a high risk because there's no social security blanket, so everybody's an entrepreneur. Um, but the investors are uh, very, 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 very adverse to risk. Mm -hmm. So that's that problem. Then, of course, they all talk about the human talent pipeline. Um, and they say, you know, it's very constrained. But then when you look at venture capital and investors, that's even more constrained. I think there are only less than 25 black VCs in tech in the United States. And if you now look at, if you carve them out and say, okay, how many of them are GP and above? It's probably about six. Right, and then you now say, okay, let me go to Africa, and then you're like down to like four, <laughs> you know. And so, so there's that challenge, right? And so you have to sort of it takes it takes a long time and a village to build this stuff out. And then of course, in the classic investment landscape for some of these you know emerging markets, a lot of the seed financing is very predatory, right? So we just we just closed a deal in Nigeria. I bounced out an investor because she could not understand why the founders ended up with sixty percent. She felt that they should have ended up with thirty. You know, and then you're sitting there going, wait, but there are four financings ahead of us. They're going to d get diluted, th you know, a third every time. And I was like, you know, you can fund companies like that. And when your founders are down to 1%, I will come poach them. Thank you for training them. And then I will fund them to do something else. Right? So there is, there is a lot of this, you know, there's, there's, there's a process. You know, the value is so different. You know, and of course, culturally, you know, you want to go be an entrepreneur. Your parents are looking at you going, you know, your cousin is a doctor. You know, your, your brother is a lawyer. These are serious professionals. What is this thing you're doing? You're embarrassing us. There's all that challenge. Um, so, you know, the Valley is, is, is something special. Uh, but I, I do think that eventually some of these, 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 these regions and some of these markets will build their own variant of it. Uh, but it will take a while. So one other thing I want to sort of add on to, to answer your question about what individually what we see about the future of like VCs, I think one of the big trends is especially with the big guys, right? Andres and Sequoia have built up a huge support staff. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't matter from, from marketing to PR to hiring, or, or just to support the entrepreneurs to build up the companies. And you definitely don't see that before. And for us- We did know, see it in the, in the height of the boom. The boom. You know, like yeah, Highland yeah. Capital yeah. fired a lot of people that were doing a lot of stuff to service. The companies, the companies, the workers, right. legal, and some of the HR, corporates do it as well. It all went away. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would say, when I was with, at, at Idea Lab, we, we had 900 people at the peak. Uh, and uh, yeah, 900 people. Uh, uh, <laughs> On payroll? But, On payroll? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, five offices. But what I would say is, uh, uh, I am not a believer in that model, uh, having gone through it. I think at the end of the day, your company and your culture are you. Outsiders can help, but a million consultants aren't as good as <coughs> 10 dedicated people for the company. I saw this again and again and again. So I, uh, I, and that's in consumer where it's probably easiest to do that. In enterprise, I wouldn't even try it. Yeah. I, I was just talking to a founder a couple of weeks ago. Uh, here in the Valley, he's part of these, one of these new unicorn, just got billion dollar valuation. And, uh, and they told me that, um, we were talking about this model, right? And they said, you know what, because they really, really held true to that. It's like, we need to build this internally. We need these people. We can't outsource to consultants. And he's like, and I, I, I was asking them about, um, uh, you know, what, what can VC firms do to help? And they said, you know, the easiest thing would just do something like line up our 409A valuations for us. So like get rid of all that crap we have to deal with that doesn't actually build value in our company and take all that away from us, right? Like just have a consultant that comes in and does that for us. And, uh, but instead, a lot of these firms are yeah, recruiting like very, very, um, you know, highly talented, high paid people. But yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to last. You know, the thing is, uh, I, I believe most entrepreneurs get it completely wrong 
when they think about what value a VC can bring, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, you hear this phrase, all money is green, that's absolutely absurd, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's like saying I can marry anybody, to use Bob's analogy. It's completely absurd. What, but the things that VCs bring are not the things that most entrepreneurs really think to value, right? Uh, I mean, the, there can be a five minute conversation of the board that completely pivots your company to a way to go because these guys have seen it 10 times. The value of experience is so fundamental. The financing decisions, the contacts helps, of course, and when it comes to getting acquired. When it comes to getting acquired, I mean, if you don't have a very sophisticated board, the chances of you, you maximizing value, I think, is pretty low. And these are the things that, for the most part, entrepreneurs don't really, because they're soft things but they don't tend to, to emphasize. And yeah. I, I would suggest to any entrepreneur, find someone who's got some experience. You, you, had, some, you had something to say? I think that from a different note, I also run companies, and one of our investors is Sequoia, and they've been very, very helpful for us, especially with business development introduction. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah, definitely that's valuable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. one, one of the biggest, uh, when you when talk about Health for VCs, one of the biggest turnoffs for me in the dating process is this idea that you know, if you get a VC on board, they're going to take you to the promise line, right? Like, if we just grab that Series A from, it doesn't even matter what fund, it's any fund. If you get it from one of the brand name funds and you're just golden, and that that's like the ticket to success. And I, I see it the opposite way. Like, I put myself in more of a, I guess in some ways, humble position where I want to follow an entrepreneur that I believe in and they're going to take us to success, right? Like, at the end of the day, the, if, you know, it dies but with the entrepreneur or succeeds with the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're looking to your VC or the fund or all the services, then now we're going to be successful, you're, you're kidding yourself. And you're going to learn the hard way that that's not, not generally how it works. Williams, you're right. There's a lot of value VC can bring in, in that partner, but they're not the gold ticket to take you to success. <coughs> what questions do you think the entrepreneur should be asking the VC when deciding who to kind of align with just because you hear the nightmare stories of the bad relationships? Like how to make mm -hmm. sure they're really looking at the skirt of the actual VC? Mm -hmm. Let's jump in on that. Um, beyond obvious ones, is I think it's useful to actually understand what stage is that VC at in its life cycle. So, um, you know, Trinity raised raised a fund not that long ago, and so you can ask them, what's your commitment period? So, over what period of time are you able to invest in new opportunities, and then follow on? And historically, what have you done, you know, you know, with follow on? So, in an extreme case, if you're biotech, and you get somebody to invest in your Series A and they don't have like even a $600 million fund. That $300 million fund, I've introduced a CEO to a $300 million biotech fund, and the San Diego entrepreneur told me, that's too small. We prefer you know, companies with deeper pockets that will, basically they want enough people in the Series A to get it all the way to a billion dollars of financing, if, if that's what it requires. Um, so wherever you are, to understand what your capital requirements are and potential different scenarios, and will this VC be parking to put points on the board and sell early and get out? Or is this VC able to you know, calmly go with you to the finish line? I would be, I would be very personal, is what I would do. Uh, why are you excited, right? Once you know they're excited. You need to understand that they are going to be your spokesperson. They're going to be talking about their hot deal to all the other VCs. And it is sometimes the case where they don't fully understand where you're headed, and uh, it, and frankly, sometimes you don't either. But <laughs> it would be very helpful if they understood what your end goal is, what you're trying to create, so that they are prepared for that once they're sitting on your board. They understand, for instance, yeah, it's going to take a lot more capital, or hey, there may be an opportunity for us to sell to these two particular people because I'm building something that's going to fit in their product portfolio. We've avoided a lot of those <coughs> challenges by understanding what the, in one case, we sold the company to VMware, and the, the CEO's lifelong goal was to work at VMware. So we knew we're probably going to sell a little early. He wants to do that. Um, a lot of people won't understand your business because there's a lot of nuances. So that, that's what I try to do. I had one VC many, many years ago, it was very honest, but when the S1 got printed, he read the S1 and he said, now I understand what the company is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will add, I wrote a, a blog post last year uh, in part uh, born out of frustration with a lot of the Series A uh, VCs in the landscape. 
because it felt like there were many more data-driven VCs. Um, and data, data can lead you to the promised land and can also lead you to hate. And, um, and unfortunately, everybody's sort of looking for data, data, data. And you know, with all due respect, it doesn't take a whole lot. It doesn't take an MBA to figure out what data is telling you. Uh, but what I detected in the, in, the, in the ecosystem was an absence of conviction on the investor's part. Right? And that's fundamentally what you're looking for. You, know, you want to have equal conviction at the table that as many routes as you're going to take to get to this promised land, he or she's going to ride there with you. Right? And that's, that's, that's personal. It goes back to the personal thing. Right? It's not about, yeah, your data is great, or yeah, this, is, this product is fantastic. It's all about you sort of really tuning into that VC and saying, does he or she have the, the conviction that's going, to be, that's going to matter? And the reason, one reason that's so important is it would be wonderful if your company you know, goes up to the right forever. Right. But it's almost always the case where there's a period where my partners and I would take half of our bacon back, mm -hmm. give up the deal. Yeah. There's almost always that come to Jesus moment. And man, the conviction helps then. Yeah. It's how you power through the, through the, through the valleys. It's just what it is. So that's, that's really up to you to detect that. And you know, if you're going to do that, bring other people, you know, watch for body language, you know, watch for the investor who cannot sleep because they have all these things they don't want to talk to you about. You know, it, it, there's just that excitement. The same one that you have about the opportunity, the investor is matching you. You're thinking, you know what, this is great. You know? And that's, you know, I think for investors, the other thing that they do, which they're really good at, is they're really great at dressing for the prom. Really great. Right, they wear all the best clothes. They look fantastic. Yeah. But what you really want to be able to figure out with each investor is, who are you when no one's looking? I'm amazed how infrequently entrepreneurs call our other entrepreneurs and ask yeah. how yeah. how effective yes. we are. It's very rare. Yeah, I would call. But we, but it's no different than hiring like for your senior management team. Yeah. In fact, I can think of two true. scenarios right now where we got into a very highly contested deal. It was actually down here um, because one of our other entrepreneurs went to bat for us, you know, which was great. And I know how many entrepreneurs are familiar with Net Promoter Score. Um, it's something we've been talking a lot to our companies about, and it's something we started then talking. We just had a, an offsite, and we started talking about it internally. Is like what our you know we started noticing quite a few of our deals were coming from our entrepreneurs, and so we were kind of. Uh, um, you know, wondering how often, you know, if we can maybe do better there even where even more referrals came from entrepreneurs. Um, so to that point, talk to the other entrepreneurs. And that's the best way also to get an introduction. I, was I will on. never not reply to an introduction from one of our uh, founders. Yeah, that's a brilliant move. Like on, on the drive here this morning, I was on a phone with a Canadian guy who had soft money introduced through one of the CEOs that we've already invested in. And she said, they're killing it, you know? And so because she's saying that, there's so much more credibility in that right away. Plus, I want to keep all my CEOs happy and saying good things about me. So I definitely took the call. I'm super thankful. It was a great call. And that CEO is already doing the Bob Pavey diligence on the VC of saying, do you want to take money from these people? I raise money from a lot of VCs as an entrepreneur, and I don't love any of them that have <laughs> invested in my company. I, I should have gone to Cleveland or the Valley and met Bob, but I, the ones I, I met were horrible. Um, you have obviously been in boards. Um, in your opinion, what makes for a well-managed board? You. You. Can you, can you, you. No, you. The board is the sounding board for your for your for essentially operational strategy and guidance. You run that as a CEO, and you know it, there are lots of responsibilities that are borne by the CEO. You're responsible for getting all the right data, you're responsible for crafting the right story, you're responsible for presenting and you're responsible for managing discussions and make sure that you can extract the most value from the individual board members as well as the group. But dynamics always matter, right? And so you always have to watch for interesting things. There are always different types of board members. Some know your business better than you, at least they think they do. So they're always willing to, better <laughs> you know, so they're always willing to sort of give you opinions that you wonder from left field or beyond that. Uh, some don't talk very much, so it's your responsibility to try to get the insights because they tend to be actually much more useful to you, but you, you have to work to pull it out of them. Uh, you know, watch for the observers because observers come in, 
you know, they, you know, they supposedly they don't have any directorial rights, but you know, they voice more than you know three boards of directors completely. So you have to manage all of that, and so it's it's a lot of a burden. It's a big burden on the CEO, but the most important thing is that you are completely focused on monitoring that relationship, managing it, feeding it, extracting as much value from it. Yes. Don't don't blame anybody else if things go wrong. <coughs> boxed up with you. Quick thing about that is um, it's a mistake in my opinion that the CEO becomes passive. So the CEO should be leading. Um, the other thing is just like in a good relationship, a good marriage, lots of communication. So communicate in advance of a board meeting happening. So there's very few surprises, if no surprises. And when going through no bad surprises. Yeah. Well, you know, like, 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 you know. So, so I'm the CEO. Of Bob's my VC. Board meeting's coming up. Bob, I got some really bad news, and I want to talk to you about it now and get your Absolutely. counsel. And so Bob's saying, well, at least this guy's calling me. Um, the worst is to go radio silent. Oh my God, I'm not going to tell anyone and even yeah. the IRS what's happening here. <laughs> so so um, communicate as much outside of the board and so there's no surprises going in. You may end up with a big syndicate and there is something toxic with one VC who doesn't have money and just pushing for a sale. Lead with a subset of the board supporting you. So if you're going into something tough, make sure you know you've lined up some votes to win the you know what's going to happen in there. And engage as early and often to help the company. A lot of the most interesting things I've done are when the CEOs say, "Okay, we have a pro yeah. We had a company that got all the way through to setting up a power plant and then had a really bad, a thousand-page report come out of the California Energy Commission denying their permit." And we could have helped them with that. How do you have a thousand page report from the California Energy Commission come out denying a permit for a power plant and not know about it ahead of time? We know the people in the CEC. Let us know, let us talk to them. It took a lot of back channel talking, but now they're at least in a process where if they provide some new data, that permit could get approved and the, the negative decision has been come up. But we didn't find out about it until the thing was done. They could easily have gotten a hold of us and said, hey, we're, we're talking to these people, we have some issues, can you go to bat for us with the relationships that you have to either help us in a business deal, to help us with a strategic partnership, to help us with a government commission. We're happy to do that. That's what we're here for. Yeah. One thing, one thing I will add is just, in everything I've done in life, there has been a learning curve that I could master, not boards. You will go to your grave if you're a VC, and you will never master it because it's just people, right? It's people, and different <coughs> people feel differently at different times. I like all these suggestions. The communication is very important. I personally like a monthly letter from the CEO. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes people think it's a little redundant. Sometimes like, well, what do I say? Well, whatever. What's on your mind? I find that helpful. I also think in every board there's an agitator, there's a champion, there's a confidant. You know, in every board there's a cast of characters. People people will fill in those, and you should know who those are. And, uh, and if you can, get someone to be a chairman who's been a chairman before. That's a really good role. Mostly not done very well, but the chairman can do, is, you know, the chairman should be the interface between you and the rest of the board members. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, one more question. Um, William, you said something interesting about just being able to communicate to the VCs what your end game is. I've been cautioned because we have kind of three stages to our to our market, and I've uh, talked to someone, at a, a couple people at the larger angel groups, and they said, you know, don't don't tell us your big scheme. Tell us just what you're going to do now, because we don't want you to feel like you're boiling the ocean. Can you all elaborate on that? Because I I think. Talking about the end game is really important, but you know how do I couch that in a way that? that I think not, you'll get a different answer. Right, I think you'll get a different answer from every VC, and there's no right or wrong. I would say this for me, I can only handle so much information in every stage. <coughs> so, as you see <coughs> that the person's really getting into it, the third or fourth meeting, maybe then when they really grasp what it is you're trying to accomplish, you say, hey, by the way, if you connect the dots see where this actually winds up that is how that's what works for me you know to, uh, if you tell me all at once there's probably a bit of hey you know th th they are trying to do a little too much too early uh, you may never get to stage two let alone stage five before somebody buys you or or whatever 
it's also a good way of, I always, I can't remember if it was the Family Guy or what it was, this own episode where uh, <laughs> I was, uh, says, you know, steal underpants, blank, make a million dollars, and doesn't know what the middle is, right? And I think that's, you get a lot of that when you meet entrepreneurs, where some of them are very good at throwing that, that overall long vision and, and very charismatic, um, but they just can't articulate or can't execute to show like, how to put those pieces together, right? So when we do our, um, if you're talking to an angel group, probably similar to like our seed stage investments. And one thing we've become just extremely diligent on, we found, is to really track milestones. And this might be what they're kind of talking to you about in terms of, Yes, they need to know what that big vision is, but what is that first milestone you're going to hit with this money that is that first step to get you there, right? So it's kind of like a, you know, and not, and not saying that that might not change, right? Like we all know how startups go, but it's a way for then investors to be able to come back and, um, and, and also kind of, uh, you know, get a bit of a judgment in terms of like, is this team executing? Are they doing what they said they're going to do? Why or why not? You know, if the trust is built throughout their relationship and you end up nowhere, um, in our last fund, one of our, our biggest outperformers came from a failed startup where the entrepreneur, we made a second bet on him when he kind of came back and said, this didn't work, but I have this new idea. But because he made, you know, retained that trust through trust throughout it, hit all the milestones in terms of testing the thesis, even if it didn't, the market didn't, uh, it didn't work out, um, you know, built a lot of confidence. So I think it's, it's that, it's that very fine balancing act between selling that big vision about how you're going to take over the world, but yet really much articulating, you know, okay, well, what are, what is the first step and how do we get there? And what's it going to look like? So it's, you, have to, you have to always be balancing. That. I, I w watch for context because some investors will get to that end point before you, mm -hmm. and you just go with them because they, they see where you're going immediately, mm -hmm. and you, you just run with them. Most won't. All right. So you need to just judge the context, mm -hmm. and you know some folks will see. You know you mentioned that end zone, and they'll be so scared they don't want to they don't want to talk to you anymore because they're like, oh, now we've seen this before and it didn't work. And of course, investors are so wedded to patent recognition that they don't see the flip side of it, which is the calcification of patent recognition. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out, okay, this investor, they get it, because they're asking you, well, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Where does this go? And you're like, wait a minute, I already have that. I, I know where this is going. But you also have to sort of watch how you sort of keep, give them information in bite-sized pieces, right? Because they, you know, we all have ADD. Right, and you know we need to sort of tune, and you know, and a lot of these things. Unfortunately, that's just the way it works. So, but me and your credibility is all that's going to matter, right? So if you sit down and say, okay, I said I was going to do A, B, and C, and then you show that you did A, B, and C, then the day you now say I'm going to go to Z, someone's like, well, your history tells me you deliver every time you say you do, so I'm ready to go with you on that, right? But you know, it's always judging the, the context. You know, watch, watch for all the signals. So on that, I believe we're out of time. And, yeah. Um, we'll Actually, sure we're, we're finishing a bit early because we're going to have a, a coffee break and we've got some fabulous um, red velvet and green tea <laughs> cupcakes that um, Jen's Cakes has donated. <laughs> and it means that you can have a little chat with some of the VCs. But before we do that, I've just got a couple more books. Guy Kawasaki gave us a few books, uh, one of the Art of Start. And my question is, What's the name that Agosa mentioned of Hollywood in Africa? What was Hollywood. 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 So who said that first? <laughs> I want to pass that down to him. Um, and uh, Andrew mentioned uh, two pieces that a, an investor looks for in a, an entrepreneur. What were the two things? They start with M. No, no. They start with M. And what? And market. Yeah. So we'll give it to. Um, yeah. uh, thank you. That, that book's actually by a, a Swiss VC, Hervé, um, who um, obviously can't be with us today, but he, he was based here years ago. Um, another one from Guy Kawasaki. Um, and my question is, William mentioned. Uh, what is really important for an entrepreneur to be looking for in an investor? What was that high priority that he mentioned very early in the piece? Well? Yeah. I'm sorry? Passion. Did that start no. with an M as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> no, um, William said. Conviction, wasn't it? No. Oh my goodness, don't tell me you've all forgotten this. It's like one of the most important pieces that you've ever seen. No, come on, guys. It was very early in the conversation, but he, he got into a very passionate speech about it. If you're, yeah, step by step, if you're looking for a VC to fund you, 
What is one of the most important pieces? The man. The man of interest. Oh my God, no! The, 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 the stage at which it is. Venture partner. That they understand your area. Money! 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 So, so William said domain experience, and, and that is a really big piece. So um, I'm a media publisher as well as an event organiser, and I really believe in content. And uh, a guy, I did interview him um, when he released this book about uh, writing your own book, uh, and I think it's important for any entrepreneur to be able to produce some sort of content. Um, so you guys, um, my brain's dead now. Some of the things you spoke about. Do you want to mention, uh, do a question? Sure. I'm, uh, well, here's, a, here's a, for you data people. Uh, how much US VC money makes up the VC in Canada last year? 40%. Okay. okay. And one more? Nice. <laughs> Anyone else want to throw out a question about something you've spoken about? How many good VCs are left in Canada? <laughs> See, four or five. Okay, Matt. Five. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, okay. You got it? Was that right? What? Five. I don't, are we all... That's what we're going with. That's what we're going with. <laughs> Great. That's all. So please um, help yourself to coffee and cupcakes, and uh, you can have a chat with the VC. <laughs>